All right, so at last we come to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which, as the name suggests, is a pretty important result. Uh, we've been hinting at this for a little while, that uh, there is some relationship between integrals on the one hand and derivatives on the other hand, right? These two sort of main pillars of calculus as you learn them in calculus one, right? And, and so back when we were looking at antiderivatives, we, we saw some circumstantial evidence that, that antiderivatives have some connection to integration. We want to finally make that precise. And so the precise statement that's going to finally kind of nail this down is the fundamental theorem of calculus, or at least one part of it. There are two parts of the fundamental theorem. Both of them tell us about how integrals and derivatives are related. So first thing to note is that for everything we're doing with fundamental theorem of calculus, we're always dealing with a continuous function. And one of the things that we know about continuous functions is that the integral has to exist, right? Um, it exists and it can be computed using Riemann sums, right? It can be computed as the limit of Riemann sums. We saw that. Um, of course, this integral does exist for functions which aren't necessarily continuous everywhere, but for the fundamental theorem of, fundamental theorem of calculus, we are going to make that assumption. Um, Another thing that's going to be relevant shortly is that this, you know, this x that we use when we write down this integral, right? Um, it's not that important that we call it x. So a lot of people will refer, will refer to this x as a so-called dummy variable, right? In the sense that you can, you can give it any other name you want and the integral will still have the same meaning, right? So for example, if you called this the integral from a to b of f of t dt, that's the exact same quantity. If you called it the integral from a to b of f of z dz, same thing, right? It's just a placeholder variable that you're using when you're doing your calculations. Think about going through Riemann sums or something like that. It's not going to matter that you call it xi or ci, right? You're still going to get to the same place at the end, right? It doesn't matter if you call it delta x, it doesn't matter if you call it delta q, you can call it delta bob if you want. You're still going to get the same answer. All right. So we have this. We have this as kind of our setup. And we think again about this area problem, right? So we've got this, this usual situation where we know that what this integral computes is if when they, we're assuming that f is positive. Of course, we know it doesn't have to be. But if it is, we can draw the picture, right? So for a positive function, this integral is computing this area under the curve, right? So it's the area under y equals f of x, starting at x equals a, ending at x equals b, bounded below by the x-axis, right? And one of the things we know about this area is that, well, it depends on the function, but it also depends on the limits of integration. It depends on these bounds, right? If I, if I move this out wider, I have more area. If I bring them in closer together, I have less area. And so one of the things that you might do is you might introduce some point midway between, well, not necessarily midway, but somewhere in between A and B, uh, we'll introduce an X, All right? And so for any value of X we choose between A and B, we get this area, right? And we'll give that area a name. We'll call this F of X. And we might call f of x the area so far, right? Or the area up to x, if you want to call it that. And you'll notice I've used function notation. And if you think about it for a second, this is a function, right? It's a function because what do we need to have a function? We need to make sure that for a given input, there's a well-defined output, right? And only one output. And that's the case here, right? As soon as I choose x, I'm just computing the area from a to x. That's some number, right? So a number goes in, number comes out. This is a function. And in fact, we know how to compute this number. All right? It's just, the, it's just an integral. Definite integrals compute area, right? So the only difference is that instead of going from a to b, we're going from a to x. And here's where I need some sort of dummy variable. 
because I can't use x again. I've already got x here. It's a limit of integration. It wouldn't make sense to put it here as well. So we choose another letter. For whatever reason, default tradition is, is to use t here. You can use u, v, s, doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to use t. Okay. So this gives us a new function. And it, it's an interesting function, right? It's, it's defined as an integral. This is not something, you know, we're used to working with cosine functions and, and polynomials and rational functions and things like that. We, we haven't seen an integral function before. It's kind of interesting, um, right? It's a brand new way of defining a function, calculates area, and you can kind of see how, how it works, right? As you slide x back and forth, the area is going to change because we're changing one of the two bounds. Um, this gives us a number. That's our function. So now we're going to see exactly what we can say about this function. All right? We're going to look at an example first, and then we're going to say something a little bit more general. 